So we raised the following question. What if we could get every kid to follow three simple rules? Graduate from high school, get a job and continue to work, and don't have children until you're 21 and married, all right? Now we looked out at the entire country and we classified people according to whether they broke all those rules or they followed one or two or all three of the rules. The results are astounding. Give me a second, I'm trying to select the appropriate weapon. Uh, watch where you stepping, them snakes all around, you know they connected. Uh, when I was a kid, my grandmama told me I can't go to heaven. So I stopped praying and asking for blessings and started preparing for my Armageddon. Coming alive. Whoa. So I started talking to judges and lawyers and doctors and health providers and interviewing people and literally asked thousands of people. How many of you have had the course History of Poverty, United States of America? I see a hand. We are segregated in America by social class. If you just think about it, who do middle class people hang out with? Most middle class people don't know someone in poverty by first name. We're not sitting down to dinner together. Today, millions of American families are caught in circumstances beyond their control. Their children will be compelled to live lives of poverty unless the cycle is broken. President Johnson's war on poverty has this one goal, to provide everyone a chance to grow and make his own way. I think everything in life that's important really lives in the gray, like there's no black and white. There's this gray of how do we make it more clear of what the problem is. There are so many different life experiences of poverty and we don't have a real clear definition of it. The federal government doesn't have a clear definition of poverty. They say if you're a family of four, you need right about 24,000 to take care of your family for a year in 2017. Does that mean that if you're making a little bit more, you're not in the red? And that, that's not the case. I think the most difficult challenge with poverty is poverty of the spirit. If you can't see your way, think your way out of your current predicament, then you're in poverty. Of course people cannot contribute to the nation if they are never taught to read or write. If their bodies are stunted from hunger, if their sickness goes untended, if their life is spent in hopeless poverty, just drawing a welfare check. So we want to open the gates to opportunity. But we're also going to give all our people the help that they need to walk through those gates. All of our welfare programs, you get money and you get more if you have less income. So if you have zero income, you get the biggest benefit. And then as you earn money, you lose part of the benefit. Sometimes if you earn even one extra dollar, you use the whole benefit. Medicaid is like that, it pays for health insurance for poor people and people who are disabled. If that number seems low, it should because it's based on 1960s cost of living. In the 60s, economists came up with a formula for calculating what does a family need. And they said things like, well, we'll have a parent in the home so we don't have to include childcare. People can walk to work so we don't have to include transportation. And employers will pay for health care, so we don't need to include that. Three major family expenses are not included in the 2017 Federal Poverty Guideline where you have more women in the workplace than ever in the history. If you look at parents, and divide their income into five equal parts. And let's look just at the bottom 20%. So this would be parents with income below roughly $25,000 a year. And now we come and watch their kids grow up and we measure their kids' income at say 30, 32, 34 years age. Are they doing better than their parents? Kids from that bottom fifth of income below 25,000 are twice as likely as we would expect based on chance to be in the bottom. It's very difficult to get out of the bottom. It's a fight. It's a fight every day to meet your needs and the needs of your family.
For in this other America we find some 40 million of our brothers and sisters perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. More must be done to reduce poverty and dependency, and believe me, nothing is more important than welfare reform. I think poverty to a large extent is also a state of mind. Poverty is a death sentence. How does poverty look? Poverty doesn't have a look. You know, because you can put some makeup, uh, some clothes on anything, anybody. Sometimes if we struggled with poverty in a certain way, we tend to be most, most critical because we say, well, we did it. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I got it done. I struggled. I had to work two jobs. I did it. Well, your situation's not the same as somebody else's because we're individuals. And our characteristics, our personality, our network of people, our demographics, the area that we lived in are different. So we can't take two people from different sections and say, well, this person did it, he must be good, and this person didn't do it. They train the elephant by tying the elephant with a little rope when they're young. When that elephant grows to be full size, a full size elephant, they put the same little rope around that elephant's foot. Because that elephant has been conditioned to only go as far as that rope will let it. Poverty works the same way. In many cases, the people I see have had that little rope around their minds. And that rope will, would only let them go so far. You know, in essence, only let them dream so far when they were children. And then when they grew up, became adults, that same little rope still tied to their minds can only go as far as that rope. The two most important things is where you're born and who you're born to. So this one guy, he said, I'll do your study for you. He said, I grew up in poverty. And I said, thank you so much. I said, tell me, how did your family get by? He said, well, my father was a physician. He died when I was 12. I had to go live with grandparents. I worked in their store, I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps, I had the right mindset and I was determined and I became a doctor like my dad. And I'm listening to him through the eyes of somebody who's fought her five brothers for the back window of the car. And I'm thinking, you knew someone who owned a store and you were related to them? That's not poverty. But if you look at it from his context, his experiences, who do the children of professionals hang out with? Um, typically, it's gonna be other children of professionals. And what people do is we compare ourselves to the people around us. And we sometimes put an umbrella and say, poverty is just poverty, and that's, that's not true. That's not the case. It's so difficult to come up with a solution to help someone when we don't understand the problem ourselves. How can we work together? How can we understand each other? And the, the answer is, we have to accurately understand poverty. What is poverty about? So understanding the perspectives of people who live in generational poverty or working class poverty or immigrant poverty or situational poverty. There are so many different life experiences of poverty and we use one word to describe them all. So many people, they, they have no idea. If you're born into a poor family, uh, if you're born into a minority family, if you're born into a family that only has a single parent, that really constrains your life chances. People die on average 15 years younger if you're born into generational poverty. Only 17% of the people born into generational poverty move out. So you move a lot and you, you just get through the day and life becomes about getting through the day. Generational poverty is the deepest poverty to cycle out of and people in generational poverty are working 1.7 jobs and every month have to decide between paying rent or uh, buying food. That's the kind of poverty I come from, where most of my family members can't read and write. There's high mobility, you're constantly evicted, uh, you're going hungry, you don't have nutrition. If you got really, really sick, you go to the emergency room and you just hope they give you samples. 
because you're not going to be able to buy the prescriptions. Working class poverty is a little different. You're living paycheck to paycheck. Don't have a lot left over, but you know that check's coming, so you feel like you have a little more control over your life. But they're very hard on themselves. They buy into the idea that if they work hard, they'll make it. And yet the labor statistics say without an education or a skill, you're going to pour your whole life. And then there's immigrant poverty, where you have people who are struggling with housing, uh, transportation, childcare, nutrition, medical care, basic human needs. And in addition to that, they have the language barriers, the cultural barriers, the prejudice, the discrimination, the racism. So they have two really big obstacles to address to really develop to their potential. And then you have situational poverty. You grow up in a middle class environment, you hear middle class words since you were in the womb, you know middle class sentence structure, you're not saying ain't. You maybe have a divorce and you fall into poverty or maybe you get downsized in your job and you fall into poverty. Those are the ones that sometimes don't find their way into our numbers that didn't fill out the papers for the free and reduced lunch. So in America, we like to think that everybody who works hard and has a certain amount of talent can make it and can join the middle class. That's the American dream. And past generations, the American dream seemed to be working pretty well. It's not working as well now. We always think that in America, the home of the free, the land of the brave, equal opportunity, and it's just simply not true. Eyes wide open, darkness closing, just stay focused, I'm not folding. Upset you, cause I'm just too dangerous. I'm dangerous. Let's be honest, say no contest. Take those comments for my concept from the get go. I just get so dangerous, so dangerous. Yeah. Through education, you can also better yourselves in other ways. You learn how to learn how to think critically and find solutions to unexpected challenges. Education also teaches you the value of discipline. That the greatest rewards come not from instant gratification, but from sustained effort and from hard work. And finally, with the right education, both at home and at school, you can learn how to be a better human being. When you look at the landscape of our community, uh, one of the things that keeps me up at night is um, our education attainment rates. Seventy percent of our citizens, our neighbors that live with us, have no post-secondary credential. Today's economy is very um, demanding of skills, and skills means education. So getting a job these days with just a high school education is a lot harder than it used to be. The chances are that you're going to be in poverty or close to poverty, and it'll be especially difficult if you're trying to support a family. So I did 20 different focus groups. I did surveys. I did interviews, expecting to find that students were afraid of math, which they are, that students need more tutoring, which they do. But those weren't the barriers that students identified that were keeping them from being successful in the classroom. What students told me overwhelmingly is the biggest barriers to their success in the classroom had nothing to do with the classroom. Transportation, childcare, healthcare, housing, food, utility payments. Statistics show that college is a very successful way to go and it's still the best decision for students, for anyone who wants to get out of poverty or level up in what they wanna do. However, I also think that the worst thing to do is go to college and drop out. Here's the goal. The goal is to graduate. You gotta graduate. Like, you just can't drop out because unlike anything else, you still gotta pay the bill. Now what higher ed would do is they would look at those success rates and they would go, oh, our students aren't as well prepared, they're not smart, 
They don't know how to study. They're not dedicated. And I think what we've learned at Amarillo College is those aren't true at all. Our students are smart. They're ambitious. They're capable. They want for themselves. They're burdened to not just provide a future for themselves, but to save their families. But they have real barriers that they bring with them. If we're going to fulfill our mission in higher education, we've got to understand those barriers and address them if we want our students to be successful in the classroom. You know, I teach people that if you don't get educated, you don't get skilled, you're going to be poor your whole life, and so will your children. It is an absolute exception of a person who earns a living. You know, someone will say, well, my uncle makes 100000 and he's not educated. But I'm quoting labor statistics and census data. That's an exception. I didn't know what I wanted to be until after I graduated from college. I think that that's somewhat normal, but I went ahead and I, I went to college and I picked a major. And um, I was glad that I had people in my life that encouraged me just to go ahead and go. And a lot of people, uh, because they've learned, they, they've been sent messages that they're not smart enough, they're not good enough, they don't try. And I'm telling you, try, try. Get your high school diploma, get your college degree, and then keep pursuing what it is that you have a skill set for and you're passionate about. One of the hardest, most heartbreaking things about not having your GED or, or your high school diploma is sometimes you hit a, a ceiling at work or you miss an opportunity. We don't want you to miss an opportunity. We, we want people to have those opportunities. I, I, I wasn't the best student, you know? I'm not Einstein, and there, there, there are not a lot of those walking around. But I graduated math, education, and you need a plan. One of the things I think we're really not talking to high school students about is this subject that I like to call the success. We teach English, we teach math, but we don't teach success. Which regardless how smart you are in any of those other categories, if you understand the subject of success, you can win. And those are just basic fundamentals of understanding, you know, how to network, how to communicate with people, but also how to be strategic, realizing what's important. College is not about how smart you are, it's about how hard you're willing to work. In every high school, we should expose kids to a program that shows the average income of people who drop out of high school and people who graduate from high school but don't go further and kids who get a two-year degree and kids who get a four-year degree when they get to be adults. The differences in those levels of education have exploded over the last three or four decades. And if we could show the kids and they could understand and say, boy, you know, if I get more education, I'm going to make more money. And that'll have an impact on every other part of my life. The most important thing is not the freedom to buy things, it's the freedom to dream and chase what you really want to do. The more money you can make and, and, now, and not spend it, it allows you to dream at a place and give you the oxygen endurance where you're not thinking short term. One thing that I think is so important to understand is how poverty steals your hope and your confidence. I was talking to, a, to the students at my tea place and I loaded one up in my car, brought them over here, walked them through the process, got them signed up, we got them enrolled. And then that student told me after we got him a schedule when it came time to go to class for the first day, he sat in his car in his parking lot for three hours and couldn't get out of the car. Um, that's, that's not because he wasn't smart or capable or he didn't want to do it. That's because he was afraid. And um, that's real, but it can't be an excuse. Everybody in their life, everyone has fear. I just challenge you to work through your fear and, and don't let fear keep you from being your best self. Don't give up on yourself. When you are educated and when you know the things that you know and you know how hard you'll work, you need to create the story for yourself. You need to surround yourself with other people who are going to speak possibility and do not allow negative people or negativity to talk you out of your dreams. What are you passionate about? What do you have a skill set for? And 
In the meantime, keep pursuing your education. You have to understand that you have so much purpose between 14 and 24 that the decisions you make not only gonna impact yourself, they're gonna impact your kids and your grandkids who you don't even know is gonna benefit from the little decisions you make today. You may not see it, but your grandkids will definitely see it. I'll tell you one story about a, a young woman. I watched her decide that she was going to be a singer. And, and I'm telling you, from the moment she decided she was gonna be a singer, she was a really a little girl at that point. Every time I saw her, she was doing what? Singing, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know, this work ethic that she had was just freaking amazing, I mean, you know, as a kid, I saw her singing all the time. And, and then when we, uh, we started this church in downtown Houston, her family joined, brought the kids, she and her sister, and, um, and she joined our choir. And every now and then she'd get a solo and, and she would put more into that solo than the whole choir would into the whole song. And now she is on the largest platform in the world. Her name is Beyonce. All because of her work ethic. From a young woman who made a decision as to what she was gonna do and be in life and allowed no one to get in her way. Will everyone be a uh, Beyonce? No. That's why you gotta have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. We have hard workers in this community, whether they're students at Amarillo College or employees in the community. We have a really hard work ethic. The issue is they're underemployed, so they're working really hard and not making a living wage doing it. Poverty is, I am working, according to census, 1.7 jobs, and still I can't put food and pay rent. I have to make a choice. So when we say you just gotta work harder in order to, to make it, that's not true. Not when you're experiencing poverty, because people in poverty are working. I started looking at who's the number one teacher of poverty in the United States of America. And my answer that I found was the media. So what's the average person gonna know about poverty and the people who live in it? It's probably gonna be things like, well, they're getting rich off welfare. If a kid in high school is thinking, it's not that big a deal, as long as I have kids, I'll be fine. I'll be getting welfare. I'll be getting a cash welfare. We'll be covered by Medicaid. I can get housing and so forth. It doesn't happen that way. In 1986, my welfare check was $408. For me, Jennifer was six, Daniel was two. My 15-year-old homeless cousin was living with me, and they said, we won't help her because she's not yours. We'll give you $408. My rent in a neighborhood called Felony Flat in Portland, Oregon, was $395. Who can do the math? A welfare check today for a family of three, national average, $478. That's 1986 to 2017. The average rent, according to HUD, for a modest apartment is $750. The average disability check is $756. It's almost impossible to get out of poverty based just on public benefits. Our labor statistics say if you take a minimum wage job and you work 10 years and you don't have education beyond high school, you don't have a skill like an electrician or plumber, the average increase after working hard for 10 years in a person's income is $2 an hour. It doesn't matter how hard you work. I mean, think about it. Who works harder, the person cleaning the hotel room or the person in their office? You don't move up without a skill or an education. So if you want to buy your mom a house, you want to make sure your kids don't go hungry, you got to get a skill. You got to get education. Now, if you want to earn, let's say, start out at 30,000 a year and have the possibility of going all the way up to 60 or 70,000 a year. You have to have skills. You have to be talented. 
You have to know how to do things. You need what we call soft skills and hard skills. Hard skills are just, you know, being technically trained to do something. Take computer literacy. Anybody who goes through school these days and isn't computer literate is going to be in trouble. And I think our schools should be doing a lot more if they're not already to teach people programming and coding skills and the whole set of things. You can't get a decent job anymore if you don't have those skills. And then there are the soft skills. And if you talk to employers, employers will tell you that they're really missing the soft skills as much as the hard skills. The soft skills are things like getting to work on time, dressing appropriately, knowing how to interact with other people, knowing how to be polite with a client or a customer, knowing how to problem solve, knowing what to do when something doesn't go quite right, you know, being a, a bit uh, creative. One of the things that helped me in my personal life was to see other people, maybe of my same skin color or, or ethnicity, and, and, and see them succeed. So it becomes attainable. You don't know what you don't know. And I think a lot of times is that's what I think holding people back in poverty. They don't know what's bigger than their town, and they don't know what they could do bigger than what they see on TV and the people they see at school and the people that their parents are. I used to work in elementary schools and you ask the kids what they want to be in life and, and they want to be doctors and, and, a, and a lawyer. But if your home life doesn't support the attainability of those things, it's a nice dream, but it's not a reality. And certain groupings and neighborhoods don't have that exposure. So it's important that our schools, our community kind of lend itself and, and expose, especially the youngest kids to that. I think one of the worst things to ask a kid is what do you want to do? It's not what you want to do, it's why do you do the things you do? You could design a life that is focused on your why. Being aware of work as a way of expression. People ask me what motivates me every day and I look, I'm just being me. I started my company because it was an expression of myself. I am just painting on a canvas. But I think if we can teach them that, think of their work and their life as a place to express themselves and then dream of what they see themselves becoming, uh, having that strategicness then makes you think more long-term rather than the short-term once. Athletes are told to picture making the shot before they take the shot. And I think that the same thing is true for the rest of us. We have to picture what our goal is, is looking like and not just pick an, an arbitrary goal, but what do we want our life to look like and then create a plan to get there. And we can help kids do better, but it's in their hands. It's in their hands. That's a lesson every kid should learn and they should accept the responsibility. I can make sure that I never live in poverty and my kids never live in poverty if I do the right thing. Wendy. I'm 18 years old. I go to Caprock High School and I am a senior this year. Growing up there was eight of us that lived together. There was a three-bedroom house. There was a lot of struggle when the economy hit and everything. My parents both, they both had lost their jobs. It was kind of hard for us to even like have food. All my life, even now, I'm still on free and reduced lunch. Still now. And I've always had free and reduced lunch. My little brother has free and reduced lunch, and there was five of us. My sophomore year, I was 15. Um, I was on a drill meet with ROTC, and coming back, I was feeling nauseous. From there, I just started noticing that I was feeling different all of a sudden. My mom's like, you're either bulimic or you're pregnant, and I was like, I don't think I'm bulimic. I was like, I eat all the time. She's all like, well, I bought you a pregnancy test. And I was like, what? I just kind of looked at her. And so I did the pregnancy test and it came out positive and we just kind of cried. So my mom told me what any other parent would say to their kid. She said, you're going to be fine. We're going to get through this. 
no matter what happens, what am I going to do? How am I going to finish school? How am I going to do any of this at all? Just terrified out of my mind. It turns out that in the U.S. right now, an awful lot of children are being born to young parents and parents who are not married to each other. That is about 50% of the births amongst the youngest generation. In other words, about half of the births in the youngest generation are babies born outside of marriage to typically quite young parents. We have learned over the years by doing careful studies that kids who are from single parent families generally get less education and grow up to earn less money and themselves have less stable families so they also have difficulty passing on their advantages to their own kids uh, than kids who come from married couple families. If more of our kids were in with their married parents and lived for their whole childhood with their married parents, that also can make a huge difference. They'll do better in school, they'll be more likely to go to college, and even though family composition has changed dramatically over the last three or four decades, and way more kids are in single parent families, way fewer kids are reared with both their parents. So I think Americans are gonna figure this out. Single parents alone have, have high stress levels, have a stigma that comes against them because they're single parents. Us as teenagers, we have these adult hormones, so we, we, we feel like we're adults, but we're, we're very malleable in the sense that we're still children in the way our emotions go up and down. And so what happens is so many kids are making these very tough decisions around friends and peer groups. Uh, they're making a lot of decisions around relationships and who they're falling in love with and their intimacy with those people. And it's just this kind of like these tough things is like what really hinders a lot of kids in poverty. I never thought I would get pregnant, ever, simply because I was, I am, I still am a straight A student. I do so much charity work, so much community service work. Everyone at school is like, Wendy's pregnant? Isn't she the smart one? Isn't she the good one from her family? Isn't she the church girl? I never thought this would happen. You don't think from one night something is gonna pop out nine months later. You just think, oh, it happened once, you're keep going with life, nothing's gonna happen. I know when you see the stick turn blue, your whole world just kinda turns upside down. Say cheese. <laughs> when we're talking about the idea of participating in risky behavior, whether we're talking about having sex, doing drugs, drinking, watching pornography, whatever it is, getting involved in social media, um, becoming really addicted to whatever device it is that you're using, if we're talking about any of those risky behaviors, I think it's important to consider the outcomes of those things. It's important to consider that we're not living for just this moment. Wait to have a child, you know, don't, don't fall into the teen pregnancy element. Really think about the cost that it takes to be a parent, the cost in time, the cost in finances, and I would encourage you to wait until you're married before you have kids. Wait until you know you've got that second parent, that second income that can help you raise that child. What kills me is when I see a kid with all the academics, they're rocking. You know, they get these all A's, they finally, they finally break this glass ceiling where they put all this hard work in their academics. But then they get pregnant with their, with their high school sweetheart. And then like they literally just take three steps back. And I think it's because there's this EQ emotional intelligence where we just don't talk about like relationships and the strategy around what you do as an emotional being. I've always been a daddy's girl. I would go to him for everything. When I got pregnant, he distanced himself a lot. He had different views than I did. When I told him I was going to keep Matthew, he said, you're gonna keep him. Well, 
I'm not gonna keep you. Like, he disowned me completely. I had Matthew in April of 2016. I called him a month later to see how he was doing, just to catch up, to see if he wanted to see my son. He calls me. He's like, I still can't believe you decided to keep him. You could have had a future. Now you're not gonna have anything. And it's been still three years. And I haven't heard from him once. I've heard it from people. One of my teachers actually said it when I wasn't there. And everyone from the class told me. She said, if Wendy was my daughter, I would take the baby away from her and raise it myself so that she could have a future. But now she's not going to amount to anything. And hearing it from my dad now, him saying, you're not going to amount to anything. You're not going to have a future anymore because I decided to keep my son. It broke me. We as a society have lied to you. We've been, we've been dishonest with you. Because what we have said to you is that you can behave any way that you choose. You can make any decision or choice that you want to make. Whatever you feel this, this day, you can make those kinds of decisions. And we will do the best that we can to alleviate the consequences. But the fact is, we cannot alleviate the consequences. It is true that you make your own decisions. You can choose any of these paths that you want to choose. But we are being dishonest to you when we say we can help you avoid consequences. There are consequences for the choices that you make. Having sex outside of marriage is not going to fill the void that you're trying to fill. It only creates more and more of a vast, open wound deep within you because you are opening yourself up in the most vulnerable way to another human being who is in no way committed to you and his, whose actions are really out of selfishness likely and a desire to meet a need that they have. The day I had him, I started getting ready. I started getting pain. And then by the time I got there, they told me it was too late for me to even get the epidural. And I'm just bawling, crying my eyes out. I was like, I don't know what to do. I've never done this. And whenever he got there, it's just, I was scared. The first time I changed this diaper, I cried. I was like, I can't change the diaper. She looked at me, she's like, what do you mean you can't change the diaper? I was like, I can't do this. I am 16, I can't do this. I cannot support for him. I cannot do school, work, and raise a child. I'm staring at this precious little boy, smile at me, and I'm thinking, I can't do this at all. The only thing going through my head was, I cannot do this. If you find yourself pregnant at 15, there is no easy option for you. You can choose to have an abortion, and that is not an easy option. It leaves damage for the rest of your life, for you and for your family. Um, having a child at 15 leads to all kinds of issues because now you're not just a typical high school kid. You're responsible for another human being. You're gonna have to find a way uh, to bring income in. You're gonna have to tend to a sick baby in the middle of the night when you have homework and you have to get up early and go to class yourself. And then your other option would be to place your baby for adoption which is the most difficult decision I've ever seen a young person make. It is a wonderful choice, and it is often the best choice for that child, but it is heart-wrenching and extremely difficult. So once you find yourself in an unplanned pregnancy, we can't take away those consequences, and you now have very difficult decisions to make. So I have my little brother, he's nine. I have my son, and well, he's about to be two in April. I wake up at six in the morning. At around seven, I will wake up my little brother. And at around 7.20, I will get Matthew ready. I'll drop him off at my sister's at 7.30, take my little brother to school at 7.30. I get to school and I'm racing. I'm running, rushing to get there. I get out of school at 1.30 and I would go into work at two. I get off of school, I pass by my sister's house, 
I play with Matthew for the 30 minutes that I have and then I go to work. And whenever I get my 30 minute lunch break, do the same thing, go to my sister's house and spend time with him, go back to work. And then I get off of work around nine. I struggle to put them both to sleep. After I put them both to sleep, I will start working on my homework at around 10.30. And I usually fall asleep at about one or two. So what I would say to a 15 year old is, I apologize that we have uh, convinced you that you are lazy, that you are entitled, that you are incapable, that you are selfish, because I don't believe any of those things about you. I believe that you have purpose. I believe that greatness is on the inside of you. I believe that you bring value into other people's lives and you'll bring value into the life of this child if you choose to carry, but it's not gonna be easy and we have failed you. And it is now our job to come alongside of and support you to enable you to make better choices going forward. My mom would watch Matthew the first year that I had him and I would always tell her, thank you mom, I love you, I appreciate you. And what she would say back was, oh, okay Mika. She shows her love differently. She would show her love by watching him taking care of me, making sure I had a roof over my head. She told me for the first time, I know I never tell you this often, but I am so proud of you. You have a baby, you are working, you're going to school. Not only that, you're getting scholarships. She told me that I was a fighter. She said, eres una mujer luchadora. You're a strong woman fighter. For me to get a message from her saying, I'm proud of you and everything that you're accomplishing and everything that you're doing for me was the best present I could ever get. This is what I have been working for all my 18 years is to get a simple, I'm proud of you. There's a group of villagers working their fields by a river when someone in the group noticed a baby floating downstream. One of the men rushed into the waters, rescued the baby, and brought it to shore. But before he could recover, a number of babies were found floating downstream. Before long, there was a steady flow of babies floating down the river, and the whole village was involved in the rescue efforts, pulling babies out of the water and making sure they were made safe but not all of them could be. Some were pulled under by the raging river, others slipped through the villagers' hands, while others fell back into the water as the villagers tried to save them. The villagers were saving as many babies as they could, but before long they became exhausted from all their effort. Frustrated, Controversy erupted in the village. One group argued that every possible hand was needed downstream to help rescue the babies. If they didn't have everyone's help, they would lose too many downstream. The other group argued that every possible hand was needed upstream. If they could find out how the babies were getting into the water, they could save all of them and eliminate the need for the costly and time-consuming efforts downstream. If we find out how these babies are falling into the river in the first place, we can stop this and no more babies will drown. If we go upstream, we can eliminate the cause of the problem. But it's too risky, some said. We might fail or take too long. We will lose too many lives. we've lost and our future children to fix the problem upstream and save anyone else from falling into the river. I drank from a separate water fountain in Houston, Texas. Water fountain marked color until I was 
12 years old. I used to think, okay, so what's different about the water coming out of that fountain in comparison to the other fountain that I wasn't supposed to drink from? And as I grew up, I realized most of the barriers that keep people from completely experiencing all that life has to offer are placed around them when they're children. You know, there are two ways to address poverty. One is to try to prevent it from ever occurring in the first place. And the second is, if it does occur, to ameliorate it. You know, provide people with assistance, with childcare, with housing. So it has to be both. It has to be both. You have to help those who are in need now, and you have to help those who might be in need in the future. And in order to do both, you have to not only work downstream, but you have to go upstream. The circumstances that, that got us to where we are are unique. And so our approach to every person and every family in poverty needs to be as unique as that person and that family. And that's difficult to do, and it's a little overwhelming to think about but people are different. It's interesting looking back historically on what we've done to address poverty in the United States. It's mostly been to provide people with assistance of various kinds. And those things are needed. I think we should not leave people destitute and without such assistance. But there's not a lot of evidence that those things are going to move people out of poverty except uh, temporarily. I don't think Americans are in favor of simply redistributing income. What they want is to provide everyone an opportunity to get ahead on their own. We believe in equality of opportunities, not equality of results. I went to a conference once. Uh, the conference was an opportunity conference where we invited 74 families from our community in hopes to uh, just allow them a pathway to cycle out of poverty. Majority of the people in uh, this conference were generational poverty. So they came in and they heard from Dr. Donna Beagle uh, her story and were encouraged. It was a six hour program and she would say, how many of you know what it is to have a disconnect notice? How many of you know what it is to receive an eviction notice? And before long, arms were coming up and she allowed them to see that if I can do it, you can too. We, we all have hope within us. Sometimes it just gets buried. So I had the opportunity to visibly see hope rise to the surface of 74 people. And that's not something that you can contain. We knew you can't contain hope. I left this place with hope and I'm going to tell everybody about it. I want them to know what I know and I'm going to succeed. Because people came in the room that didn't know me and I mattered. I was important. I belonged, I am part of, right? I'm no longer in this isolation where I'm irrelevant or I have to walk around and lead with this label of shame. Uh, little by little, the hope starts to take that label off. And when people come into place, you're able to replace that label with words of worth uh, instead of allowing that person to feel less than. We all are the same when it comes to what our basic needs are and what our basic desires are. And I think if we really think about what we have in common with one another, that's where we can start to create a basis of understanding. A person saying, I'm not going to judge you, I'm not going to criticize you, I'm not going to devalue your lived experience because it's different than mine. You say to the other human being whatever dream you've ever had is still possible. When I was growing up, it felt like there were a few kids that were completely off the rails. And there were a few kids that were trying really hard to make good choices and really had their focus set where it needed to be. But most of us, 
We're somewhere in this gray area where we're trying to get our toes as close to the line as we can without completely stepping over. But we weren't really convicted either way and we're just all kind of trying to get by and get along. What I see now is that there are more kids off the rails. There are very few kids in this gray area. But there are a lot of young people who are committed, who are strong, who are focused, who want to make good decisions, and who are making and having an impact on the people around them. That is my hope for the next generation. hope comes from the stories that we tell. That hope comes from us saying to our scholars, you can do this. We're going to stand by you. We're going to help you get through this. They have the power to turn the ship around. And it happens by making one good decision after the next. If you want to be bigger, you have to realize that things you do from 14 to 24 are compound interest of things that like were going to take you to places that you can't even understand. What you do today is going to play more compound interest than anything else. You're playing a game that's bigger than yourself. You're playing a game for yourself, for your family's name, for your kids that don't even exist yet, and for your grandkids who are going to benefit off of the hard work you put in today. Not all poverty is preventable, but we know certainly um, that based on research and the research that we're using for our programs, um, some of it can be preventable. We want to help that. We want to help the community around us. And that's what we're trying to rally our community around and support. A lot of times when I work with people who currently live in the crisis of poverty, they'll say, well, I'm not smart enough to get a skill. I'm not smart enough to go to college. you got to ask for help you got to ask for help, and poverty teaches you don't ask for help. Um, that's the wrong message. Uh, you, nobody makes it alone. Absolutely no one. We have to work together. We have to overlap with other organizations. We have to be a community fighting this. The key is allowing hope, and we can't allow hope. We can't communicate hope. We can't allow worth until there's relationship. If we can spark a movement that not only helps those who are in the river, but also gives them the tool to help their kids and their kids' kids not be in the river, that's the movement we want. When we reach out to people across these barriers of, of poverty, barriers of political opinions, we can really find some unique treasures in people who are different from us and find out that they're not so different after all.